In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus said that my words are spirit and they are life. Jesus said that heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will endure forever. That men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. His word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against him. His word is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. His word is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. His word is undeniable, irrefutable, absolute, and never changing. His word is forever relevant, life-giving, everlasting, and the foundation for our lives. His word is here today, so let's open our hearts and our minds. Let's put our hands together and get excited because we're about to be changed by God's Word. Come on, y'all ready? This is Wednesday night. We came ready. We came hungry, yes? We got a great night planned. There's an awesome, awesome uh, just anointing, I believe, what God is touching and doing in, in our midst. And we got some awesome praise reports to be able to give out and talk to you about some things that are going on. And, and as we are preparing for that, Tonight's going to be a special night. Usually, the Colleen campus, they, they do their, their individual Wednesday night. They're here with us on the weekends, but they do their Wednesday nights. But because this is going to be a very specific and, I believe, a very awesome thing, they're going to tune in with us tonight to be able to kick off this new series. We don't always do series on Wednesday nights, but this one I've heard directly from God. I'll talk about it a little bit more, but the series is The Promises of God. How many of you want to know what God has promised you? I want to know what He has spoken to me. I want to know what He has promised me, what He has said, what He has given me. I want to know that which He has put within my life and before my life so that I can walk it out and receive it and do those things. But we're going to go into it in just a second, and I want to get you get you ready. So if you got your Bible, if you don't got your Bible, you can point your hand to the screen. We'll have it up here for you. But let's make this declaration together over the Word tonight. Say, Father God, we thank you for your Word. For your Word is a light unto my feet. It's a lamp unto my path. Your Word changes me from the inside out. I'm ready to receive. I'm willing to obey your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all ready? All right, let's welcome the Colleen campuses. They're joining us live right now. Let's just tell them how much we love them. We love you guys. We're with you. We're believing for God to continue to do some amazing, amazing things in our midst. Can I give you guys a huge praise report? This is crazy. On Sunday, between both campuses, we had 70 people water baptized. Isn't that amazing? We had 70 people water baptized. We had 42 people give their life to Jesus. And then we had 32 people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit Sunday night. That's an amazing weekend. Don't tell me about the parking lot. I don't want to know. I can only imagine, and it will stress me out like crazy. I just want to know that what God did in here was awesome. We ran literally service on top of service on top of service, even had to begin third service at the Austin campus five minutes late just to give people time to get through the door because there's no parking spots out there. But that's a good problem to have, isn't it? All right, let's get into this. The promises of God. This is going to be, I don't know, maybe a month, maybe two months. We're going to go through it. We've got some good things I'll tell you real quick coming up in the summer. We're going to be doing a series after this in the summer on Wednesday nights. We're bringing back the Book of Revelation series. I think what a good time with how crazy the world is today. Jesus said you'll know the signs of the time are near when these things are happening, when there's wars and rumors of wars, when men become lovers of themselves. And he goes on through and teaches those signs that we should be paying attention to. And he said that day doesn't mean that it's there. It just means that the end is near. And so it's good to understand the best that we can, the book of Revelation. It is a book of prophecy. It is a book that we know that God has given us to be able to help us get an idea of what to expect and how to prepare ourselves. And then on Sunday mornings, we're going to do the Turn It Loose series in June. 
and we're going to just let all of our pastors just be able to get a word from God, and we're going to go through that, and then we're going to go into, in July, August time frame, we're going to go into a series on Sunday mornings that is called The God I Never Knew. And every single family that comes is going to get a free book. I didn't write it. Pastor Robert Morris of Gateway Church up in Dallas wrote it. It's one of the best books I've ever seen on revealing to us who the Holy Spirit really is for us in this time. And so it's going to be awesome, awesome summer. You're not going to want to miss that. I know we're thinking June and vacation, but it's going to be awesome all the way through. Okay? If you got your Bibles, you want to open them up. Open up to Isaiah chapter 54. We're not going to start there, but we're going to, we're going to end there. And I'm going to go through some stuff before the, we get there that you need to know and you need to understand what God is speaking. When God gives a promise, it's not like a man's promise. When God gives his word, it's not like any other word that you've ever received. When God gives his commitment, his covenant, God is giving you an ironclad guarantee that this will happen. Look at this, Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? This is God speaking. This is his word for us. When we know we get a promise from God, we can stand on it and know that we know. We may not see it today. We may not see it tomorrow. But the day will come when that promise is carried through. When he has spoken, the day will come when action will be taken on and for our behalf. Why do we know that? Because he can't change his mind. He's not human. He can't lie. He's not a man. He is not able to lie. There's some things I did a series when we first started the church, the things God can't do. Everybody got all freaked out coming in. But there are some things that God can't do. God can't lie. God can't change his mind. God can't turn around and take something from you that he's given. He said the call and the gift are irrevocable. Nothing we do can ever snatch it from our lives. We can just choose to walk away and not use it. So God's promise to us beginning off is that when he has spoken, he's going to act. And when he has promised, he's going to follow through. Wouldn't it be awesome if everybody did these two things? Then we wouldn't need God, right? But look what God says. Out of his own mouth in Psalm 89, 34. No, I will not break my promise. I will not take back a single word I said. That's good stuff. I will not break my promise. I don't care what you do, I'm not taking back my word. I don't care how you act, I'm not going to take back my promise. I don't care what's going on around you, I will not take back a single word that I have spoken. This is God's promise. This is him saying, if I promise you something, it's guaranteed. Isn't that the way you say it down in Louisiana? Guaranteed. Now that might be Texas. We'll call it East Texas for now. But he's given us this amazing promise of the promises. This isn't just a specific promise. This is a bold, outlandish, crazy, in-your-face promise for the promise. He's giving you a promise on my promise that I'm not going to break my promise. He wants us to know that there's nothing that is going to keep his word from coming to pass. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ. That's how his promises get fulfilled. It's through Jesus. With a resounding yes and through Christ our amen. Which means, yes. When we say amen in church, it's not a religious thing. It's just a cool way to say yes. Yes? (laughs) But watch how much better it is. Amen? 
You can put a little bit of uh, in that amen. It's like, yes. You know, that starts to be a little creepy. But if you do an amen, you know, which means amen, ascends to God for whose glory? It's for his glory. God gives you a promise. He fulfills it through Jesus, and he's telling you that it is yes and amen. There's no taking it back. There's no no to it. There is not any removing it. It is yes, and it is amen, which means yes, which in other words, he's giving you a double enunciated promise to say to you, I'm going to do it. Yes, yes, I'm going to do it, but not just for you. I'm going to do it for you, through you, and to you to bring glory to me. Okay? So there was the first promise that God has ever spoken. In Genesis chapter 3, 15, when he spoke to Satan, and he said, I will cause hostility between you and the woman, speaking of Mary, and between your offspring and her offspring. He, Jesus, will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. What does that mean? That Satan got a bite on Jesus' heel when Jesus got nailed to the cross. But when Jesus came back up out of that grave, he crushed the head of the enemy for us, right? So that was God's first promise. And then look at God's last promise. It's in Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. He who is faithful, he who is the faithful witness to all these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. This last promise written in his word is to us to say, I'm coming back for you. I'm coming back for you. It may not be tomorrow. It may not. But to him, people say soon. Well, it doesn't feel very soon. It's been 2,000 years since he spoke that. Well, when you're an eternal God and there is no such thing as time, soon is pretty, pretty long for, for humans, right? God can say it, it's a, a day unto us is like a, th- a day unto him is like a thousand to us, right? A year unto him is like a thousand to us. In other words, he is not, he is not bracketed by time. He is time. And soon to him, when he looks upon the millennials, upon millennials, upon millennials, that he has had humanity in the earth, and all the millennials and millennials before humanity came to earth, a couple don't mean much to him. But he gave us this understanding to watch for the signs. We'll go into that when we go into the book of Revelation in the month of June, July, August time frame. Let me give this to you. This... Isaiah 54, where I said to turn to, if you didn't, it's okay. We got I'm going to bring it up here on the screen, all the, all the key ones. I'm just going to read this. I'm going to read it first, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to pick it apart because God started to do something in me in Isaiah 54 three weeks ago. He began to speak to me about this three weeks ago, and this is why, you know, when I announced that we're going to have another campus coming soon, we have always are planning. We always are strategizing. We always are, are looking for ways to reach more people. But there was not, that was not an intentional, I thought about it ahead of time coming in. When I read this scripture and I read it to you today, you're going to see the revelation of God blow off of the page into your heart, and you're going to see exactly that that came out of me Sunday was not planned. It was spontaneous, even though I knew ahead of time three weeks ago that we're what we're going to do and where we plan to do it. But let's just read it, and we'll see what God has to say. In verse 1 of chapter 54, sing, O barren one who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud. You who have not been in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. This is where God began to speak and show me what we're about to do. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Listen to what he's saying. I'm going to go into a little bit deeper in a second, but he's telling us something. He's not asking us. He's not suggesting. Suggesting. He's not hinting. He's telling us, enlarge the place of your tents. In other words, wherever you dwell together as a church family, get ready to make it bigger because I'm about to do something. You've got to stretch out 
the habitation. you got to make it bigger. And then I love this. Do not hold back. That's in verse 2. Do not hold back. When God spoke that part, when I read that part, man, it jumped off the page like a billboard to me, and I heard God telling me, it's time. Let's move forward. Let's go win this city one by one. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes, for you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your offspring, they will possess the nations, and and they will populate the desolate cities. Fear not. For you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood you had, and you will remember it no more. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife, deserted and grieved in your spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I may have deserted you, but with great compassion I now will gather you. In overflowing anger for just a quick moment I may have hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. This is like the days of Noah to me. As I swore to the waters of Noah, should they should go no more over the entire earth. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you. I will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills may be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. And my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. O afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, behold, I will now comfort you. I will set your stones in antimony. I will lay your foundations in sapphire. I will make your pinnacles a gate. Your gates will be done with cubicles, and all of your, your walls and your will be made of precious stones, and all of your children, they shall be taught by the Lord himself. And great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall not fear nor be far You shall not fear of or be far from oppression, for you shall not fear. And from terror, for it shall not come near to you. If anyone stirs up strife, listen to this. If anyone stirs up strife, it is not from me. Whoever stirs up strife with you shall be because of you. There's going to be a hedge of protection placed around this church where no strife, no strife is going to get in unless we allow ourselves to be used to do it ourselves. Behold, I have created the the smith who blows the fire of coals and produces a weapon for its purpose. I have also created the ravenger to destroy No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that would rise against you in judgment, he, I, shall condemn. For this is the inheritance. This is the heritage of the children of the living God. I'm going to take a small pause here. Do you notice that he doesn't say no weapon can never be formed against you? He doesn't make a promise that no weapon will ever be able to be raised against you, that it will never be able to be made with the intent to destroy you. What his promise is here is that no weapon formed against you will prosper. Attacks will come, but you will overcome. 
That's his promise to each and every one of us. That's just, I'm not even talking about that promise tonight. I'm not, I'm not even going to get that far tonight. But that's just one of his promises. His promise is not that you will not be attacked. His promise is that that attack, that attack will not overcome you. This is the heritage of the children of the God. And their vindication comes from me, declares the Lord. Isn't that good stuff? Shall I go on just a little bit more? Let me go on just a little bit more. I'm going to read chapter 55 now. That was all 54. Come, everyone who thirsts, come and drink the waters of me. And he who has money, come and buy and eat. Come. And by wine and milk without money, without price, everything you get from me, he's saying, isn't going to cost you that. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, for the labor, for that which is not to satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that which your soul so that you may live, and I will make you. I will make with you an everlasting promise. My steadfast, sure love for David now will be yours. Behold, I made him a witness to the people, a leader and a commander for the people. Behold, you shall call a nation that you don't even know, and that nation that does not know you, they shall run to you and serve you. You you shall call unto a city that may not even know of God. We shall call unto a city that may not even know of this church family. But we shall call unto a city, and even if they don't know us and we don't know them, God's going to send them. God's going to bring them from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man forsake his unrighteous thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And then our God, for he will abundantly pardon our sins. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. In other words, he don't work like us. He don't think like us. He don't act like us. When we get into a situation, we get all stressed out. Here's what ends up happening. Let me tell you. When we get into a situation and that situation begins to overwhelm us, if we allow fear, if we allow anxiety, if we allow stress, if we allow worry to even get a foothold in our life, what we are doing is we are making our problems bigger than our God. But when we give it to God, then we make our God bigger than our problems. There's no problem on this earth that's too big for him. He created the whole thing. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return from where they once came, but they now go into the water of the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bringing bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it to do. Isn't that so good? Oh, I love it. Verse 12. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace, and the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn, they shall come up from the cypress. Instead of the briar, they shall come up in the myrtle. It shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that they shall not be cut Ah, and then just verse 1 of chapter 56, thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come, and my righteousness will be revealed. What I just read to you, just that 
10 minutes or less of reading. There are 10 promises of God given to us just in that short context of Scripture. 10 guarantees. Can I get into some of them? I probably won't have time to get into all of them. But we're going to go back and we're going to look at it. Because here's what I want to tell you before we get there. The thing about God's promises, there is like God's promises are attached to his will. How do I say this better? So God's promises go forth as his will goes forth. And remember, there's three parts of the will of God. There's God's sovereign will. Nothing can change it. He sent his son to give his life as a ransom. Nobody could have stopped that from happening. Then there's God's perfect will. And that's God's, his deep desire for your life, for my life, for our church family, for Austin. His perfect will doesn't always come about because he's not forcing our will to come in to his. He gives us a choice. So if the city of Austin refuses to listen, then that's the way it remains because he's a perfect gentleman. He's not going to force himself upon anyone. And then the third one is the permissive will. And the permissive will is anything that doesn't fall into the perfect and and the sovereign will. In other words, if you still got breath in your body, even if you're not living the sovereign, perfect will of God for your life, you are in his permissive will, whether you're doing good or bad, because you're still living. Right? So we got to look at God's promises going in perfect unison with his will. In other words, there are sovereign promises, and he will strike your heel, but you will crush his head. That promise was sovereign. Nobody could change that. And then we've got the promises that are God's perfect will. It's God's perfect word. It's God's perfect belief for your life. But when it comes to God's perfect will for our life, the way that we can see it come to life in our lives is this way, is by obedience to the condition that he set before he gave the promise. Every promise he gives that we can have, there's always a condition that he's, if you want this, then do that. Or do this, and then I will give you that. And some people seem like, well, why would God do that? Why wouldn't God just give it? Do you give your kids allowance without them earning it? Do you applaud their mistakes? Do you celebrate? Their failures? Can you imagine raising a child like that? Are y'all here? Some of y'all must be doing that. You got real quiet. Can you imagine if your kid bullies another kid at school, maybe puts their hands on them, and they come home and you celebrate them? What you're doing is you're creating a future terrorist. I'm not talking about defending yourself. I'm talking about celebrating a kid's mistake. If a kid gets an F, are you telling them, man, you did awesome. I'm so proud of you. Now you get an allowance. That sounds crazy, at least to my generation and older. <laughs> I love the next generation. I've given my life for them. But they have this sense of entitlement. Why do we have to work for that? Why do I have to earn my way through school? Why can't somebody just pay for it? Why can't I just have this for free? Why do I got to go get a job and make enough money to do that? This is how this nation was built. You work. That's how God says. You rise up in the morning and you work with the sweat of your brow till the sun goes down. You work. You man don't work. A man doesn't eat. Right? So... If we were to raise a generation, and maybe we have, if we were to raise another generation, if we were to intentionally, I don't think it was intentional, that's the difference, and God's intentional in every single thing that he does. 
If we were to raise a generation and we were to teach them that we are going to reward you, well, I guess I guess we are doing that. We got these participation trophies now, right? What does a participation trophy do? It diminishes the kids that worked hard, listened to their coach, and did everything right to win the championship. It diminishes the value of the win, the value of doing right, because you know you get rewarded no matter what you do. So everything that God does, he's saying, I want to do this for you, but I need to see this from you. Could you imagine making a paycheck without ever going to work? Dell just announced in the newspaper today that all their employees, every one of them, are going to be laid off for a year with full salaries and pensions and health care and everything. That's a joke. That really didn't happen. But could you imagine? I mean, it doesn't work like that. You don't go to work at Dell, Dell ain't paying you. If you don't do your job, Dell ain't paying you. So God, we look at God and we just think he's just so loving, so merciful that he should just do it. But if he did, he would create a earth filled with monsters. Are you with me? So here's all I want to do. I want to go through Isaiah 54, and we'll just go until we run out of time. I know I won't get through them all, but, but we'll go, well, maybe I will get through some of these. But we'll go through, and, and, and we'll pull out first what the promise is, and then what God says that he's expecting from us to receive it. And the first one starts right in 54, verse 1. He promises us increase and overflow. It says, sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. You have not been, you have not labored in vain. For the children of the desolate one now will be more than the children of the one who is married. In other words, those that could not have children are about to have more children than the married ones that have been married and have children already. And it's not It's not speaking literal to the women having physical babies. It's speaking to those that have been barren. This city is one of the largest unreached cities in America. It has the least amount of people going to church per capita of any other large city in America. It's barren. But get ready because we're about to see an increase, an overflow of souls coming in. How? What what, what is What is God saying to us? Should we go out and work? Should we beat on doors? Should we do door hangers every Sunday, every Saturday to lead in to every Sunday? No, no, no. Here's what God says. He said, sing. What? Sing? Like some Michael Jackson? No, 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 no. Sing. Some Adele? No. Sing. Cry with a loud voice under me. I don't know about you. That's why I love Wednesdays so much. I don't know about you. It doesn't even matter on Wednesdays. This is something that happens to me every day. If I feel like my problems all of a sudden are becoming bigger than my God, the very first thing I do is I put on worship music and I just begin to sing. And I'm telling you, man, within 30 seconds, I start to shake it off. Within a minute, I start to forget about it. Within, a, within the next minute, I don't even know where I'm at anymore with that problem. I don't even care anymore about that problem. My eyes are not on that problem. My eyes are on the Lord. And if my eyes are on the Lord, the problem doesn't matter because he's going to take care of it. We want increase. We want overflow. In your personal life, in our corporate life, then we need to sing. We need to praise the Lord. We need to keep our eyes on the prize. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus so that everything else will become that much more clear. That's the promise. Overflow. Increase. How do we get it? We get it by singing unto the Lord, by praising our God. Right? Look at this next one. Isaiah 54, 2. Here's the next promise, that he's going to spread us to the left. And he's going to spread us 
to the right, that he is going to, let, let me just read you what the promise says. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your offspring will possess the land, and you will populate the desolate places. He's about to give us more territory. He wants to give us more land to occupy. I just had a meeting. I'm just going to say it just because I feel led to do it. I just had a meeting with the Assembly of God, the first meeting I had with them when we first started talking about helping each other and, and partnering together so that they want to plant churches and they want to use Reach Church as one of their models to do that. And, and we had the, the superintendent down here to preach, and he's an awesome man of God, all that good stuff. I went up there to, to I had the honor a couple weeks ago to go up, and, and I got to speak to every single leader of, of the North Texas entire district of, you know, 600 and some churches. I get to speak to them from my heart. He said, just share whatever God puts in your heart. And then after that meeting, Lucas went with me. After that meeting, I met with his assistant, his right-hand guy, and I said, Mike, you once told me that there was more churches dying than there were being planted. And he said, yes, that, that's, that's, that's the truth. I said, and you told me that that even means some of those churches that have, that have just died off, that they're literally, the buildings are just sitting empty. He said, yes, yeah, that some of them are. And I said, I want to see which ones are empty because I want every single one of them. You give me every single one of those buildings and we'll plant a life-giving church on the inside of them and we'll reach every community that that place is in. And then he took me in a room and showed me the wall and said, let's get to it. Here's all the ones that right now that we need to start working towards and seeing what we could do. And I'm praying for that. This is how radical with this. And it all came out of this Isaiah 54. When I read it, it just exploded. God's about to do something that we have yet to even, even imagine or fathom of what he's going to do. All right, let's move on. Number three. No, I'm sorry. Oh, here we go. Look what he says, spread left and spread right. In other words, he's going to give us land and territory that we didn't build or own. He's going to give it to us. But here's what he's saying, how to get it. And he tells us, enlarge yourself. Increase your capacity. Not just physically, but spiritually. Increase your capacity. Listen to what he said. He said, enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitation be stretched out. In other words, don't just wait on me to do something for you. You got to get up and make room for me because when I come in, you're going to need it, right? So whatever's going on in your life personally, you've got to learn how to enlarge your capacity, enlarge your faith, enlarge Enlarge your love, enlarge your hope, enlarge your, your family, the, the room. You gotta, the, the Paul says that to each of us is given a measure of faith, and that measure is not the same. And it's because of the capacity that we have to hold what we have been given. But if we can increase that capacity, then we can have more. And one of the main ways to enlarge is through prayer in the Spirit. That's Jude. Pray in the Spirit at all times so that you may increase and enlarge your faith. So here's another one. Isaiah 54, 4. He said he's going to give you compassion and he's going to redeem you. Do you know what this word redeem means? This is crazy. I've never studied it out. I've always just took it as it was and I, I kind of correlated it to a restore. The word restore means to put back better than it was before. I've always kind of just, you know, he's going to gather back what belonged to you. He's going to go into the enemy's camp and all that good stuff. But, but listen, this is what it means in Aramaic, which is what this was written in. To redeem means to avenge, to revenge, to ransom from death, from bondage, and from exile. When he says he's going to redeem you, he's going to go fight every battle for you. He's going to go avenge every situation 
for you. This is why Jesus said it's so important to forgive. Because when we forgive, we release it from ourselves and we release it to God. And God is always going to bring vengeance and he's always going to bring a, a, a justice to whatever injustice has been done as long as we don't get in the way. But how do we get this? How do we receive his compassion? How do we allow him to redeem us? And it says, fear not. Verse 4, fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will not forget, the sh- you will forget the shame of your youth. No fear. We need to have no fear. If we can let fear and faith are enemies, they are arc rivals. Fear and faith cannot coexist in the same habitation. If I am a person of faith, then I cannot be a person of fear. It doesn't mean if I'm a person of faith, I've never let fear in. It just means I don't walk in fear. I don't live in fear. And if vice versa, if I'm a person who does walk in fear and live in fear, then that means I'm not a person of faith. But he's telling us to fear not. And if we can get to ourselves in that position where we let all the anxiety, the stress, the worry go, and we can allow him to be our guide, our vengeance, then he is going to have compassion on us. Think about that. He's going to have compassion. Why? Because he knows what you've been through. Don't fear from what's been done to you. Don't don't worry. Yes, you may have been hurt in a church. Don't come into this church fearing that you're going to get hurt again. Trust God. Yeah, you may have been hurt in a previous marriage, and maybe God has blessed you, and you're now in a with with with, with a with a with a better situation, or you're believing for it to be. You can't walk into a new relationship with fear in your heart, because fear breeds contempt. Are y'all here? So we want to make sure that we are walking in the compassion walking in the redemption of God and the way that we can walk in that is to get fear out. When we let fear go, then we have put ourselves in a position to be able. I'm going to do one more. One more and then we're going to go into communion. Isaiah chapter 54 verse 11. It says this, your children, they're about to be blessed. And righteousness is about to be given to you and into your entire family. Listen to what he says. Oh, afflicted one, storm-tossed, and not comfort. Be comforted now. Behold, I will set your stones in precious, uh, in, in, in precious stones. I will lay your foundation with sapphires. <laughs> I will make your pinnacles of a gate, your gates will be done, they're carbuncles, all of your walls and precious stones. And then here's what it says in verse 13. All all of your children shall be taught by the Lord. I want God to teach my kids. I want him to be their guide. All of your children shall be taught by the Lord the Lord. And great shall be the peace of your children. Oh, in righteousness you shall be established. In other words, I'm about to pour righteousness like concrete and you're going to be the rebar. You're going to be set in righteousness. This is what he goes on to say. You shall not be far, or you shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear. And you will be far from terror, for it shall not come near unto you. This is his promise. How do we get it? How do we get it? This is so beautiful. Here's what he says. His command was, be comforted. What? My children are going to get blessed like crazy. My children are going to get peace like crazy. I'm going to be set. My family's going to be set. In righteousness, how? By me being comforted 
in him. That means I don't run to Jack Daniels for my comfort. Oh, come on, somebody. Listen now. I don't watch nasty soap opera driven, whatever it's called today, reality TV to try to get my comfort. I, I don't gossip on the phone with my girlfriends to try to get, not my girlfriends, oh, I got a wife, but you don't talk about it for your girl. I don't, let me clarify that. I'll be getting whooped when I get home. I, 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 don't, I don't gossip to be comforted. I'm lonely, I'm tired. I don't go on the internet and look at things I shouldn't be to be comforted. Yeah, but, but they talked about me, they hurt me, they let me down. I don't go and, uh, and, and defame them to be comforted. I don't try to defend myself and tell my side of the story before they get to tell their side of the story to be comforted. I've got to run to him. When I run to him for my comfort, the Holy Spirit is the comforter. When I run to him for my comfort, then he's promising me. He's got my back. I'm going to raise your children. I'm going to speak to them. I'm going to put peace in them. I'm going to set you and your family in righteousness. You are going to be in the right standing with me at all times, on all occasions, because you know who to come to for your comfort. You don't run to the world for comfort. And you surely, let me give you one last piece of advice. We're going to do communion. You surely, surely do not run to somebody else that's hurting to be comforted. Hurt people hurt people. You take your hurt and tell someone hurt, you're going to hurt them and give them second offense against the one that hurt you. They're going to give you their second offense against the, the one that, that hurt them. And then all of a sudden, they're going to make it right. You're going to make it right with the people that hurt you. And then they're going to always be offended at the one that hurt you. You don't run to hurt people. You don't wallow in the pit. You always go up with your problems. You go to your parents, to your pastors, to, to spiritual coaches, to life group leaders, to dream team uh, directors. You always go up with your problems. You never go across, nor do you go down. When I'm saying when you're hurting, when, you're, when you need comforted, you don't go into somebody else that's unable to do it. Then you just set yourself up for failure, and you set them up for the same. We want to be comforted in him. I want to run to him. He's my father. He's my daddy. He's got the best in mind for me. Amen? Can we give Jesus one big one for his word? We're going to take communion here in just a moment. This is the first Wednesday, and we want to celebrate Jesus in a beautiful way. Communion comes with a promise. He promises us that when we partake of the bread that represents his body that was broken for us, that we receive wholeness in our soul. We receive healing in our bodies. And when we partake of the juice, that we receive joy in our spirit. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. So when I get his joy, I get strength. When I get strength, I get better. When I get better, I move forward. When I move forward, it's harder to hit me. When you can't hit me, then I keep getting stuff done. And the more stuff I keep getting done, the more confidence I get in Christ. The more confidence I get in Christ, the bolder I become in him. The bolder I become in him, the louder I become for him. The louder I become for him, the more people around me begin to get in. Are you with me? This is how it starts. And he's given us a promise. But before we get there, he also said that we should never, there's a condition, we should never partake of communion without first putting our heart right before God. Otherwise, we're inviting the wrath of God onto our life. And we don't want that. So I'm going to ask just for a moment if we can bow our head and close our eyes at both campuses. Just for a moment. Reflect in your heart. If there's anything in your heart that you need to get before God, 
or if you have never in your life made a commitment that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you've never experienced what it's like to be forgiven and washed clean and to have every sin, every mistake you've ever made wiped out like it never happened, then now's your time. Or maybe you have. But you feel like your life is not representing that commitment that you once made. Then recommit it tonight. If that's you and you're here and you want to say yes to Jesus or you want to recommit that yes to Jesus without delay, without fear, without worry on the count of three, I want you to put that hand up nice and high in the air and we're going to pray a prayer with you right there in your seat and then we're going to all receive communion together. Hands are already going up. If that's you on three, I want you to put that hand up. One, two, three. Come on, hands are up all over. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So many hands. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for those hands. For all of you that raise that hand, place it right on your heart. And we're going to pray this prayer. I'm going to ask that you would pray from the depths of your heart. Let the conviction in your heart come out of your mouth where your own two ears can hear it. And everybody here, let's all join in. And let's all pray this prayer and back them and help them in this. Let's, let's be a good family member, a good brother, a good sister to them. For those that are making it yours, you make it your personal prayer. Repeat after me. Just say, Jesus, I believe in you. You are the Son of God. You gave your life for me. Now I give my life to you. Forgive me for every sin, every mistake I've ever made. From this day forward, I dedicate my life to you. Give me the strength and the courage to live it for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So proud of you guys for making that decision. We're going to receive this during this worship song. We'll partake both of the wafer and the juice together. But I want to encourage you before we do, Jesus said do this always in remembrance of him. He gave his best for us. Let's celebrate him tonight and let's believe for every need in our life to be met with a yes and a amen as we partake of communion together. Amen?